Hello boys and girls, Navin out on No Limit Hold'em. Today we're going to be talking about No Limit Hold'em's paradigm shift that has happened in recent and not so recent years. I talked to many students who are still sort of stuck in this circa 2000 or even circa 2006 poker philosophy where they say things like, well, don't I let them free roll me here and shouldn't I bet for information and... Uh, I don't want to let them draw out for free, and a lot of things that just aren't as important as people think they are, uh, but used to be kind of the whole big thing back in the day. So we're just going to talk a little bit about how poker theory and poker players have evolved uh, theoretically, and as poker players and as human beings. Well, we're not going to talk about the human beings part, but you get the idea. Back in circa 2000, oh, nope, sorry. Did not mean to uh, pull that slide up. Uh, yeah. So, back in the day, the old school tight aggressive players generally would play razor fold pre-flop and they would only call on occasion. They would typically raise if they thought they had the best hand. Uh, they would raise if they uh, didn't think they had the best hand because they wanted to protect their hand. They didn't want to allow their opponents, we didn't want to allow our opponents, to take a free flop and have a shot at cracking whatever hand, uh, pre-flop razor or old school tag as pre-flop aggressor believed to be the best hand. Mainly the goal to pre-flop poker, it started off as a battle uh, over the blinds and if there were antes, you were starting out just trying to capture the blinds and antes. Once more money got in there through flat calls and re-raises, the goal was still simply to pick up whatever money is in the pot at the first possible opportunity. The goal was simply to win the pot. However much money was in there uh, to start via the blinds kind of dictated the strategy and whatever the action was uh, in addition to just the blinds and antes, uh, whether it was a raise and a call and a three bet or a raise and a three bet um, or somebody had opened in front of you uh, the the size of the pot at the point at which you made your option dictated your play and dictated how big you were going to raise if you did decide to three bet and whether or not you thought you had a profitable call uh, it wasn't too much about stacked pot ratios or implied odds comparing the size of the uh, the bet that I'd have to call in order to, to, to win potentially however much money is in the stack that I was going for. Implied odds were not really thought about that much. It was more about express odds. And we were really playing the pre-flop game and the post-flop game like they were very separate games. And being good at pre-flop and being good at post-flop were sort of like two different things, two different types of poker. Uh, the old school tight aggressive player, if he was the pre-flop caller, he was calling because he just thought he had the right odds to see the flop. He thought, well, I, I may well not have the best hand now, but I have a reasonable chance of improving to the best hand, and I think I've got the right, uh, I've got the right pot odds, and to some degree also in implied odds, although maybe we wouldn't have thought of it in terms of implied odds. We would have just thought, well, if I... If I do hit the flop, I can make a big hand, and if I make a big hand, maybe I can win a big pot. Uh, the goal of pre-flop caller was to invest a little bit to win a lot, and really to stop the pre-flop raiser from running him over. So the pre-flop ranges back in the day, um, circa 2000 to, um, you know, at least 2006, I'd say. Ranges were very static. Um, everybody opened like the same stuff and, and limped the same things and you know it was pretty well established that we were going to open these hands from these positions. There were charts, everybody used a chart, you know. Um, and it was believed and really widely accepted that pre-flop poker was so straightforward and so simple that you could learn to play at an expert level just by holding a pre-flop chart. I, I, I remember the days when I had uh, hand rankings and, and open raising and um, I had the Howard Letterer on No Limit Hold'em video series that came with this handy dandy chart that would tell you when to 
when to raise, when to call, when to three bet. I mean, it was a neat little chart. I had, I remember having that taped to the uh, the desk where I played poker online. Anyway, so indoctrinated sort of consensus ranges, uh, mostly raise or fold pre-flop in flat called hands when they were speculative. Very, very rarely were we flat calling hands that had like two big cards. If we had two big cards, we thought that our hand was either strong enough to raise or re-raise, or we were, if it wasn't strong enough to raise or re-raise, it's probably because we felt like we were uh, dominated too often. We were very, very concerned about playing hands that were easily dominated. And I mean, it makes good sense to think about that, at least to some degree. But we were like way, way, way too worried about domination. Domination and flush draws. We were way, way, way too worried about being dominated. And we were way, way, way too worried about our opponent having a flush draw on every flop where it was possible for them to have a flush draw. The new school approach is going to be more dynamic. <clears throat> In fact, if there's one big term that, that can most easily... In fact, if there's one word that you could use to contrast uh, the old philosophies about poker and compare them to the new, it would be dynamic. The new school poker players are dynamic players. Everything they do is player dependent. Every player has their own ranges based on how they feel things should go and what they're comfortable with, and every player is changing the ranges based on the ranges of their opponents. Uh, they're also changing the ranges based on the game type, the dynamics, the stack sizes, everything is player dependent. Uh, everything is dynamic. Everything depends on everything else. When you're using range A and I'm using range B, it could well be that your range is going to beat my range, so I have to adjust it based on the range that you're using. Uh, and the ranges are going to be adjusted based on how big the blinds are uh, compared to stack sizes. Uh, how often are we getting three better, or, or how often are we getting squeezed? I mean, there's all kinds of things that are going to change the way that a new school player is going to uh, play poker in that it's going to change the way that he constructs uh, his, his ranges, all of his ranges. Um, so in the new school, another kind of uh, interesting and relatively new concept is flat calling with hands that split the gap. And uh, also you're going to flat call with hands that have implied odds, which was not really explicitly said back in 2006, uh, but it was, you know, sort of implicitly known. Um, but we were flatting very few hands that split the gap. Uh, the gap is actually literally the, the, the gap from the gap concept. So um, I'm thinking about hands like uh, king queen pocket nines, ace jack suited, ace ten suited, king jack suited when there's like a late position raise and you're on the button. Um, back in the day, if we had ace jack and the cutoff open, we were going to three bet. Why? Because we had the best hand. You know, that was it. That was the only thing. Uh, if you have the best hand, you ought to raise. If not, you're making a, a fundamental theorem of poker mistake, which is true, right? Um, but, you know, because we don't play with our hands face up at any point in the game, you can't really use the FTOP to decide exactly what ranges you're going to do what with. Uh, so, yeah, we would never have thought to flat, like, ace-jack on the button versus a loose aggressive play, uh, player's open raise from middle or late position. No way. Uh, we would have three bet it and then folded to a four bet, most likely. Um, so, flatting with hands that split the gap. Uh, and flatting with hands for their implied odds. Kind of relatively new concepts. Um, raising as the favorite or raising to fold out your opponent's equity. Sort of a new concept. You know, we were not thinking in terms of if I three bet, am I going to be a favorite against my opponent's continuing range? We were just thinking, am I a favorite against my opponent's range now? And if so, we would three bet or four bet or whatever the case would be. Um, so raising only when you're a favorite against your opponent's continuing range or as a bluff to fold out their opponent's equity, relatively new concepts. Um, in the good old days, No Limit Hold'em was a game of chicken. I don't know how many people figured that out, and I'm not sure I understood it as such in-game, game being life in 2006, but uh, I'm not sure if I figured it out then and there. 
while it was actually going on. But if you think about the way that we thought about playing poker, it very much was like a game of chicken. Every decision point revolved around trying to win the pot. And the player who was able to uh, become very aggressive was able to become very aggressive really just because he was using his cards as a backup plan. You know, the idea was, I want to raise or re-raise or do whatever in order to take this pot down. And if I, if I three-bet against the guy that opens and he folds, sweet, you know, I, I win the pot. And that's just as far as we took it. So a guy could open-raise. You know, I could have had Gus Hansen to my immediate right, and I could have been on the button. He could have been in the cutoff. And when everybody opened to him and he open-raised a range of like 60%, and I look down and I've got king and queen suited, I am three betting him, you know, or I would have, because I thought, well, geez, he just opens every hand and I'm so far ahead of him, you know, I've almost definitely got the best hand, I don't want to give him a chance to outflop me, uh, that was the, the ultimate cardinal sin, right, so I would three bet, and Gus <laughs> would have folded the hands uh, that I wanted to flop against, and he would have four bet me with the hands that, uh, well, any hand he four bets me with is going to work out about the same. I'm going to have to throw away my king queen. Uh, and when he does flat call me, I'm going to be up against a range that my king queen doesn't perform quite so good against. So, you know, we've we figured some things out since the good old days. But in the good old days, we were trying to win pots, and we were using our cards only if our opponent got stubborn and wanted to take a flop with us. And in those cases our cards were sort of like a backup plan. Um, the only time we were doing any calling, um, and, and this is pretty specifically the circa 2006 when, when I was playing tons and tons, uh, the only times that I like to call pre-flop is if I had like a pocket pair that wasn't good enough to raise with or re-raise with, a uh, suited connector in position or a suited ace, and that was about it, like small pair of suited connectors and suited aces. Uh, that was your calling range. Uh, the pre-flop, uh, it really was, again, thought of as not the same game as post-flop, and if we did have to go to post-flop, that was sort of the whole, you know, backup plan, is okay, we're going to take a flop, um, if we were a pre-flop raiser. But our, our plan was pretty simple. We were going to fire a one-half uh, pot continuation bet and our opponent was going to fold most of the time and we were going to win anyway uh, If our opponent called Then if we had it we would continue and if we didn't have it we'd shut down Most of the time if our opponent was pre-flop caller he, It was understood that he was not repping a strong range. It was understood that pre-flop razor was quote supposed to have the strongest hand end quote so the pre-flop razor was repping strength pre-flop caller was not and so it was sort of known that pre-flop caller either had to hit the flop or check and fold, and that's what would happen. Nobody really knew how else you would play, you know, what are you going to do, like just call somebody with like two over cards and a backdoor flush draw in position and just hope they check the turn? Well, yeah, but you know, maybe we weren't the brightest kids back in the day. Uh, and I really think that um, that C-bat was so amazing back then because of the dynamics and just the way that everything kind of happened to be. Um, as pre-flop caller, if you would have thought you had the best hand before the flop, you would have raised before the flop. So you wouldn't have been the pre-flop caller. And since you sort of admitted by calling that you didn't think you necessarily had the best hand, then you were also sort of saying, I need to hit the flop in order to continue. And since you were only going to hit the flop two-thirds of the time, then most of the time that meant checking and folding to a continuation bet. Really this tight aggressive play with a uh, mandatory continuation bet of almost 100% of the time. It, it be, and we were doing that just because we were trying to win pots, right? We were playing pretty aggressive pre-flop, um, playing very razor fold pre-flop, and when we got called and we went to the flop, we were betting because we knew that we could still wrap a big hand. We knew that we still had aces, we still could have kings, and our opponent can't have those hands. And they're not just going to check and call with like some, you know, three to a straight flush or, or something like that. Not even usually, um, you know, bottom pair. They're just going to fold so much of the time 
that making a continuation bet, uh, bet was so profitable and this strategy was so profitable. I think by pure accident. I really believe that the tight aggressive strategy, I don't think it's anything like a GTO strategy. I don't think it's anything like a uh, really what you would call a, an objectively good strategy. I think it just happened to win really almost by accident against the metagame that we were playing against back then that consisted a lot of very loose passive calling station type players that did play fit or fold post flop. They did call too much pre flop. Uh, so that meant they weren't going to have strong ranges post flop, which meant that they were going to do a lot of check folding. And when they did make uh, some kind of a decent hand, they were very likely to make a, a good second best hand against our tighter ranges. So I think it's just really, somebody had to win, like some archetypical type player had to be the best, right? And I think just based on the way that everybody else played, the metagame pushed tight aggressive players to the top of the, uh, uh, of the circa 2006 food chain. So that old guard was built on some certain, uh, certain guiding principles, uh, protecting your hand, uh, taking free cards when you're probably not the guy with the best hand. And very much, uh, poker was thought of as a game between made hands and drawing hands. Like, it was uh, not just Hold'em either, but I guess Hold'em in particular was thought of as kind of a, a battle uh, post-flop between drawing hands and made mediocre, like, top pair type hands. So <clears throat> when you had a flush draw in 2006, uh, if you called the suited connectors preflop and you made a flush draw and your opponent checked to you, I mean, it was just an automatic thing that you were just like checking and taking your free card and just so happy about it. Uh, also, if you were preflop raiser, this might be, and this is crazy, but this might be one of the times when you actually would check back rather than making a continuation bet. Because if you flopped some kind of a draw and your opponent checked, it was awfully tempting to just take that free card. You know, you didn't want to get check raised, you didn't really want to have to put money in to pay for it. And semi bluffing was sort of a uh, was sort of an advanced concept back then. As crazy as that sounds, but you know basically you were putting your opponent on a hand rather than a range. And that led to all kinds of goofy things. But that's how people thought. That's the only way we knew to think. Um, and you were really just comparing pot odds to win odds, or well, we'd call it equity now, and uh, trying to make your decisions based off of that. So if you could take infinite to one pot odds when you had a flush draw, it was pretty tempting. The EV we thought of as being like infinite EV, basically. You know? um, so we would limp in with speculative hands. We'd raise or fold our Broadway type hands. And we would call with speculative hands versus raises. Uh, the idea was to start with the best hand and charge your opponent an unfair price to draw against it. And that's where that three times the big blind plus one per limper uh, whole that that idea came from. Is that if you were starting with the best hand and your opponent was in the big blind, if you made a pot sized bet which was right around three times the big blind plus one per limper, then you were giving your opponent a price of two to one and he was only going to hit the flop one time out of three. So he knew he needed two to one pot odds to call if he were going to make money every time uh, he hit the flop. But we also thought that by starting with stronger hands than our opponents, that um, two to one would not be a fair enough price for them to take. You know, that was sort of where it all stemmed from, is if I have ace king and you have queen jack, you should not take two to one because you're, yeah, you're going to hit the flop one time in three, um, but when we both hit the flop, I'm going to be ahead. When we don't, either one of us hit the flop, I'm going to be ahead. And if you hit the flop and say I bat and you call and I hit the flop on the turn, I'm going to have the best hand again. So it was sort of this like perfect bat size. In our, you know, I've had lots of talks. I was on uh, Poker School Online back then when it was kind of, uh, it was a paid you know, subscription thing. And I talked to a lot of people about this, and it was sort of, uh, this is the way we looked at it. You know, at least the, the group of people that I was trying to think the game through with, this is the conclusion we came to. And, and it really makes a lot of sense. So, I, I mean, it makes sense compared to uh, what everybody was doing back then. 
Um, it, it makes sense mathematically if you think about it in those terms. Because three times a big blind puts you at almost a pot, or just about a pot size bet, right around a pot size bet. If you add one per limper, you're still getting pretty close to that pot size bet. A pot size bet would give your opponent two to one pot odds, and your opponent would uh, only hit the flop one time in three. So he needed two, one, uh, two to one pot odds uh, to call and try to hit the flop if, yeah, well, okay, you get the idea. So pre-flop poker was the battle over the blinds, and if there was more action, then it, it, whatever option you were at, whatever the size of the pot was at that exact moment, that's what it was all about. The pot-sized open gave the big blind a bad price to call, and when somebody open raised, making it three times the size of their open raise gave us that two to one ratio again. And again, remember that you're going to hit the flop, you know, one time in three. So if I'm starting with a better hand than you, and I give you a price of two to one, it can feel like you're getting the right price when you're not getting the right price, especially if you're dominating. And I think that's where it came from. So what's changed? Has anything happened lately? Okay, so in the last, like, ten years, the marriage of pre-flop and post-flop play range manipulation, polarization, SPR, pot geometry, GTO, uh, ranges at all, uh, capped versus uncapped, polarized versus linear, barreling, floating, uh, none of those terms even existed to my knowledge in 2006. Uh, we would uh, never think about flatting with hands that might be the best hand, that would be suicidal. Um, balancing ranges, well, we mixed up our play, does that count as balancing ranges? Blocker effects, man, we had... Uh, some ideas about grouping and, and the bunching effect. If a bunch of players folded in early position, then there was probably somebody had a good hand in later position because of the, the bunching, I think it was called, the bunching effect. Uh, repping bluffs when value betting was never, I never heard anybody talk about it. It was pretty well known that you had to uh, represent a, a value hand when you were bluffing. You had to like tell a story. Um, but repping a bluff when you're a value betting was not something I'd ever heard of. Um, dynamic sizing, well, no. No matter what, it was always three times the big blind, even if we were playing off of 20 big blind stacks, you know. Um, plus one per limper, uh, obviously. Uh, dynamic ranges, no, everybody knew what the ranges were. We all played the range. I mean, you know, if you were in the know, you were, and you played good pre-flop poker, and if you weren't in the know, then you were playing some weird ranges and you sucked. Uh, value targeting, yeah, there's a concept, right? Like, actually thinking about what second best hands could call you if you decided to bet. There's an idea, not an idea I came up with, not an idea that anybody I knew had in 2006. Taking pot control lines, no. No, pot control sounds an awful lot like allowing our opponent to suck out on us for free. Hero calls, well, the fish made hero calls. The good players knew better. We didn't understand polarization anyway. Okay, so let's just look. I think this is going to be fun. Let's just take a look at some hands that could have been played in either 2006 or 2016. And you tell me if you can decide and determine which one is which. So here's uh, the first iteration. All the players have the same hands. Or, well, you'll see what I mean. Okay, so here we go. Undergun has pocket sixes and limps in. Middle position has king queen suited and raises to four times the big blind. The cutoff has ace jack suited and he thinks about it for a little while. He can't just call and let the other players in, let them suck out on him, uh, so he feels like this is a raise or fold spot. He goes for a raise, he elects to three bet to twelve times the big blind. Under the gun has no decision at all, as pocket sixes will either be a small favorite against some overcard holdings or a big dog going to the flop. And middle position has a real problem. He's got a real dilemma on his hands. With king-queen suited, he could be flipping in against jacks, and folding would be terrible, uh, or tens. And his hand is suited, it is connected, so he's got some suck-out potential. Um, but he could easily be dominated by ace-queen or ace-king, pocket-queens, pocket-kings, or pocket-aces. So, reluctantly, he decides to call, but play very, very cautiously, really probably preferring to hit some kind of a big draw rather than a top pair that could put him in a truly agonizing spot. 
Okay, so now, in the second iteration of this, all of the players in all of their given positions have the same hands, but this is how they might look at things differently uh, in this era compared to the other era. So under the gun opens to three times the big blind with pocket sixes. Middle position calls the open with king of spades, queen of spades, and the cutoff has ace of diamonds, jack of diamonds, and he decides his hand is almost strong enough to overcall. Uh, and he's got a really good blocker with the ace. He's got the jack as kind of a backup blocker. You know, it's another sort of blocker. Uh, and he's got the uh, suited ace in case he does have to go post flop. And he's got two Broadway cards in case he does go post flop. So, um, you know, and using the top of a folding range or the bottom of a flatting range to construct your bluffs or to pull bluffs out of is usually going to make a lot of sense kind of in and of its. Uh, you know, just on its own right. So, uh, and he also figures it's going to be very unlikely that under the gun's going to four bet because he's got the ace blocker and middle position called. So he's not going to get out of line, and he probably doesn't have that many big um, hands that actually want to do it for value uh, by way of there being a middle position caller and by way of him having an ace. Um, so. Uh, middle position almost never has a back raising range. Uh, the guy with the ace jack of diamonds here, uh, our player in the cutoff, has not been squeezing. There's not been a lot of squeezing going on, and uh, it's just not something that you see very often in these $20, $40 live games to begin with. Um, so uh, the cutoff figures that he's probably got almost enough full back B to get the job done pre flop. Um, but his hand also has so much playability post flop. Um, and he's rarely going to get folded out pre-flop, so he's almost always going to get to at least see the flop. Uh, so he's going to have good c-betting opportunities, good double barreling opportunities because of his good playability. If he actually gets there once in a while, he's going to maybe even have some good nut potential and, and good synergy to, to work with post-flop. So the more he thinks about it, the more slam dunk this squeeze begins to look to him. So middle position decides he ought to have some hands that that, that uh, flat call versus a squeeze and he really can't think of any better hands than uh, the exact hand that he holds so it goes open flat squeeze fold flat those are different things right that was a different situation now let's see how these uh, hands play out post flop okay so going back hopefully you figured out this was the old school and this is the new school uh, so let's carry on with the old school. Middle position with the king of spades, queen of spades, and cut off with ace jack of diamonds. Go heads up to the flop of ace, ten, seven, two tone. Ace of spades, ten of clubs, seven of clubs. Middle position checks to the razor. Now the uh, the razor doesn't want to see a hand like nine, eight, two clubs, some worse ace x, some worse ten x, king, queen, or queen jack have a chance to suck out for free. Uh, and he also needs to find out where he's at now because he does have top pair, but it's not a super good top pair. He's got a jack kicker, but he's beat by ace 10, ace queen, and ace king. So he needs to find out where he's at. He doesn't want to lose his entire stack if he's beat by, you know, ace 10, ace jack, ace queen. Ace king probably would have raised pre uh, pocket sevens or pocket tens. Even beyond that, he's going to see about this board when he doesn't have a hand, so he may as well see about it every time he does have a pair, right? And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because we thought it did then. Uh, cutoff does not have the right pot odds to call. He's just got a gut shot. And even if he hit his straight, it would be the jack of clubs some of the time. And he wouldn't know what to do. So he's got the most trivial fold in the world here. And I'm serious. Like, for sure, in 2006, if I get to this flop and face a C-bet with king-queen, I'm tossing it into the muck. Even king-queen of spades. That's so sad and so terrible. But yeah, I mean, even if I was in position, I'm sure I would have probably just set up. I don't have the right pot odds. Better luck to me next time. Um, okay, so the new school. Middle position and cutoff go to the flop. Remember, the, the pre-flop action was different here, too. Um, it went raise, uh, call, squeeze, fold, call. So we have a squeezer and the guy that called the squeezer. The squeezer's in position. So middle position is preflop caller and um, cutoff is the preflop squeezer. So middle position and cutoff go to the flop of ace, 10, 7, two tone, club, club, spade. Heads up, um, MO, that should be middle position. Uh, middle position MP checks the preflop razor. 
Uh, planning to call with gut shot, backdoor, flush draw, and the nut no pair. Um, I can see an argument for check raising. I can see an argument for check calling, but check folding seems kind of nitty to me. Uh, but um, he, he decides that he's going to check and call as a float, uh, thinking that if it gets checked down, if the dude that's in position just shuts down with some hand that doesn't have a pair, that the king queen, the nut no pair, uh, is going to have enough showdown value to make him prefer to check and call as to check and raise. Um, personally, I think it can go either way, and I'd probably most likely check raise um, with that exact hand. Um, but I guess, you know, you're going to want to have some other hands that call, and a lot of it depends on what you're doing, in my opinion. A lot of it would depend on what you're planning on doing with your sets. So if you get here with a pocket pair of tens, which would make a lot of sense, um, if you're checking and calling this flop with that hand, then I think you should check call with the hand that we have here in this example. Um, but if you check raising pocket tens, then I think you should be check raising the uh, king queen gut shot back to a flush draw uh, as well. So, but anyway, I'm not playing this hand. This this guy is. So middle position checks, planning to check call, um, and pre-flop squeezer thinks about betting this top pair. Um, but he figures he's about out of ace-ax combos uh, that he beats, and he doesn't want to, so he, you know, he, he doesn't want to bat, 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 uh, and he doesn't want to run into a set, he, you know, he prefer not to run his top pair into a set, um, and he also figures that there's going to be some draws that are in villain's range from his perspective, and if he gets check-raised by one of those draws, he's going to be in a bad situation, so probably better to pot control check back, maybe induce a bluff on the turn, get our hand one street closer to showdown, underwrap it a little bit so maybe we can start value betting if check two on the turn. Um, and he's also going to want to have some ace x in his check back range and this seems to fit the uh, fit the bill, seems to be just right. So he checks back. The turn is a six of club, cutoff took the nine eight and the uh, club club hands out of preflop razor's range when preflop razor checked back rather than c bet, thinking he would have c bet uh, all of his draws on that ace high flop. Uh, so middle position feels that his gut shot is enough equity to just go ahead and put out an over bet here against the capped range on the turn, and then jam most rivers. So he over bets to one and a half times the size of the pot, and he gets called. Um, the river comes out the jack of hearts, and now the middle position player has rivered the nut straight, and he moves all in, and the cutoff figures that he is underwrapped somewhat because he, uh, or he's at least at the very top of his range, and he improved, and if he's going to fold here, then he's way too exploitable, and he'll have no hands that he can ever get here with and call. So he decides to call, and he gets the bad news. So these are two different ways that people looked at poker at various points in time, space, space-time. In this uh, area here of the space-time continuum, we're a lot more advanced, and we're thinking a lot deeper and better about things. This is the old way to think. Now, if you listened to the way I described this, the first, uh, the first paradigm of play, and you related to a lot of it, and over here you were thinking, what the hell is Navanad talking about? Has he lost his mind? Then you need to come over to the dark side, because if we're the dark side, the dark side is winning, you know? In summary, don't use old static ranges and try to win pots at every opportunity. This is not a game about winning pots, it's uh, about EV. Don't just call for odds and, and raise to win. Don't play limp or call with speculative hands and raise or fold uh, all of your big cards. Um, don't think in terms of all these different types of bets, like uh, pro bets and blocking bets and uh, protection bets and all of that. That's silly nonsense. Uh, there's only two reasons to bet. You bet when you're a favorite to win the pot, hoping to get called, or you bet when it works out better for you if you bet and your opponent folds than if you check and let him bet or... Um, yeah, you, you bet to fold out your opponent's equity, or you bet to get called in a spot where you're a favorite to win either by or at showdown. Now, that's not the same as saying for value or as a bluff, because sometimes you'll have, like, 
I don't know, a gut shot, two over cards, and a backdoor nut flush draw. And just based on your opponent's range, if you bet, you expect that he's only calling you with better hands, but you do want him to call. So are you bluffing or are you value betting? Well, you're not doing either of those things. You're betting because you figure that you are a favorite to win the pot, so you make more money the more money that's in the pot. So you're betting hoping to get called, not because you have the best hand, just because you're going to have, like, say, a good barreling... Uh, you're going to win more than your fair share of the money that is put into the pot on this street is a good reason to bet. The other good reason to bet is to try to take your opponent off of his equity. Um, did I say protect your hand? No, no. Although, I mean, I guess you can kind of think of it like that some of the time. Uh, but once you bet and your opponent folds, it doesn't matter what your hand was. I don't know what you're protecting. That doesn't really make sense. And... Um, it's just better to think of it as folding out your opponent's equity because some of the times you're protecting your hand when your hand is beat, right? I mean, sometimes you're bluffing. But you don't have to think of it in terms of, like, two different things, like a protection bet and a bet, or three different things, like a protection bet, a bluff, and a bet that's designed to uh, stop your opponent from realizing his equity. You guys are getting kind of silly with all that. You're just betting because it's good if your opponent folds. That's why you're betting. Uh, so the other reason is to, you know, there's two reasons to bet. So if you're thinking in like, you know, pro betting and blocker bets, all that stuff, just come, come over to the new school. It's better here. We win money. Um, dynamic ranges, raising for value or to deny equity only. Uh, call because your hand is part of a good calling range. Raise if your part, hand is part of a good raising range. Um, don't open lamp. Um, Pre-flop and post-flop are the same game. We're still just playing poker, and all of the decisions that we make pre-flop really stem from what's going to happen post-flop. You know, I mean, it's it's one game. We got to marry those two games. We got to marry pre-flop and post-flop together, create a, a unified thing, a happy union, and uh, get our poker shit together, kids. All right. Well, that's all I have for you today. Hope you enjoyed the video. Till next time. Uh, now I'm not over and out good, quote, L-U-C-K, exclamation point, end quote.